And then take a moment to renew your motivation. Okay, so we're on page 13. We're zipping along here. (laughs) Okay. On the two truths. So from the perspective of subtle dependent arising, all phenomena are empty of inherent existence and exist by being merely designated by names and concepts. Okay. How then do we maintain a coherent notion of our everyday world? How can we accept causes producing results and maintain the distinction among different objects if ultimately everything lacks inherent existence and instead exists by mere designation? The Buddha's teaching on the two truths, ultimate and conventional, helps us understand this. So this has been an issue with all the Buddhist traditions. You know, once you say that there is no uh, soul or, you know, permanent independent self or substantially existent self or anything you can identify as the person when you investigate and search for it with ultimate analysis. Once you say that, then people say, well then, who exists? What exists? If that doesn't exist, then, uh, you know, when I say uh, I'm walking down the street, who in the world is walking down the street? Because I thought you just said there's no self that was there. Or you say that, that we are reborn, but if there's nothing permanent that goes from one life to the other, then how can the person be reborn? And who in the world carries the karma from one life to the next? So this has been a topic of debate and discussion for a long time. Okay, so every Buddhist tenant system, you know, has to come up with some idea, some way to do this. So most of the tenant systems say in the end, well, actually, you know, there's no soul or self that's like permanent and partless and independent, but the mental consciousness, for example, is the self that's what gets reborn yeah and so we the this the mental consciousness is the self or you know they they say the you know the collection of the body and mind the collection of the aggregates is the self the prasangika say hey you know when we examine and we look and we try and find something you know, some independent self that is the essence of meanness, we can't find anything. So it's true that the mental consciousness goes from one life to the next, but it is not a self and it is not a soul. Okay, because if you say that the mental consciousness is a self, then I and mental consciousness should be exactly synonymous. So then when you say, I'm walking down the street, you should be able to say, the mental consciousness is walking down the street. Yeah, the mental consciousness doesn't walk. It doesn't have legs. 
It doesn't have form. It can't walk down the street, okay? So the mental consciousness cannot be the self. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's this whole thing of, you know, if we can't find anything, you know, that we can pinpoint on the ultimate level, how do you assert things existing on the conventional level? Okay. And so this is where the, the beauty of the Prasangika system is. You know, they say why you can't find anything when you search with, you know, with ultimate analysis. When you don't search, there's an appearance. Things appear. But they're like illusions in that the way illusions appear and the way they exist are different. So things appear to us to have some essential nature, but in fact, they don't exist that way. They exist on the level of appearances, but you can't find anything that is it on the ultimate level. Okay? So ultimate truth, which in the Prasangikas is the emptiness of inherent existence of all phenomena, is the actual way phenomena exist. Ultimate truths are true in that they exist the way they appear to the non-conceptual wisdom of Aryas. So that non-conceptual wisdom of Aryas, Aryas are people who have seen reality directly and non-conceptually, yeah? So to their wisdom, emptiness appears the way it exists, or exists the way it appears, you know? In that emptiness is empty, okay? Emptiness also lacks any inherent nature, yeah? And, it's, and it appears the way it exists to its primary cognizer, which is that meditative equipoise of Aryas. Um, Samvirti, the Sanskrit word translated as convention or conventional, also means veil. Okay, so this is talking about the other kind of truths, indicating that the actual truth of an object is obscured or veiled the veil being ignorance, the mind grasping inherent existence. Okay, Due to ignorance, phenomena appear inherently existent, whereas they are not. Veiled truths are not true. They do not exist as they appear. They are true only for ignorance, and as such are false. Our everyday world of people, things, and experiences are veiled truths. So in our ignorance, actually, we think all these things are ultimate truths. We think that exact that the way things appear to us is exactly the way they exist. You know? So the, like the person with their sunglasses on since birth, they are sure things are that tinted color. Sure. Okay. But actually, the real color is obscured by the sunglasses. In the same way, you know, we think that because things appear objectively existing out there, independent of everything else, including our own mind, we think that because things appear that way, they actually exist that way. Okay, and but they don't. Why not? Because if they did, we should be able to identify exactly what that essence is that makes them them. But when we look through their basis of designation, when we look through all their parts, all their qualities, everything, we can't find anything that is it. Yeah. When we don't search, things appear. 
when we do search, they kind of dissolve. Yeah. So that's why emptiness is said to be the ultimate truth. Yeah. And all these things around us are said to be veiled truths because their actual nature is empty. But that nature, that ultimate nature of phenomena and people is obscured by the veil of ignorance. So things appear true to ignorance. They appear as if they, how they appeared to us is how they exist, that they appear out there and they exist out there. Okay? But that's only an appearance to the ignorant mind. Things don't exist that way. So what's actually appearing to our senses and even our mental consciousness is a false appearance that we don't recognize as false because we have those sunglasses on. Yeah, and we think it's true. So that's the big boo-boo. Yeah, that's the big mess up. And it gets us, the reason it's problematic is because when I think this cup is, you know, a cup from its own side, independent of everything else, then when something happens to my, you know, and, and also it happens to be my cup, it's my inside of it. Then when something happens to my cup and she's taking away the lid <laughs> of my cup, you know, and wiping it with a tissue that we don't even know if it's sanitized or not. <laughs> yeah, and walking in front of the camera on her way back. <laughs> Okay, then, you know, I have something to say about this because this is my cup. Yeah, it's not your cup. Don't you put your paws on it. Okay, so, you know, this is why things are a problem because if they have some in inherent nature in and of themselves, yeah, then the things that appear to me as pleasing to me and as the source of my happiness become inherently valuable and I've got to have them because they even appear to have happiness inside of them. Yeah, chocolate appears to have happiness inside of it, doesn't it? Yeah, okay. Whatever you're attached to, it appears that there's actual happiness inside of it. When you're middle-aged and you get your, your red sports car, there is happiness within your red sports car. Okay? So whatever it is that we're attached to, yeah, then, you know, because I'm inherently existent, it's inherently existent, it, you know, is the cause of my happiness, then I want it. Yeah? And then, because I want it, you can't have it, and I'm going to fight with you to get what I want. And so we create a lot of negative karma. Okay. So that's why this grasping at inherent existence is a problem. Okay. Because we make everything in our life very concrete. Yeah. These ideas are my ideas. I thought of them. I wonder if we've ever had one original idea, <laughs> you know? Or do we just learn ideas from other people and combine ideas together? Yeah. But anyway, that doesn't matter. This is my idea. And if it's my idea, I'm going to fight for my idea, even if in the process of arguing with you I realize my idea is wrong. I can't give that up because I am an inherently existent and my reputation is very important. 
So right or wrong, I've got to preserve my right, my reputation. Yeah. So my idea is the best idea. Your idea is low grade. Yeah. So I'm better than you. We get arrogant. You know, and the world's unfair. So people like you more than they like me, over even though my idea is better than yours. So I'm jealous of you. Okay. So you can see, you know, all these problems, you know, go on and on and on. To give another example, people gave me the title Dalai Lama. <laughs> if you attend a public teaching that I give, you look at the person in the front of the room who is speaking and think, this is the Dalai Lama, as if there were an objective person out there, a person that exists from his own side. But when you search for exactly what that person is, you can't pinpoint anything. You see the body of a Buddhist monk and hear a voice. Through my body language and speech, you have some idea of what is going on in my mind. But when you look in the body, speech, and mind, you can't find the Dalai Lama. He is not his body, speech, or mind. The appearance of the Dalai Lama as an inherently existent person is false. Actually, he exists because on the basis of the collection of the body and mind, your mind forms the conception of a person that you then designate Dalai Lama. So the Dalai Lama exists by being merely designated by name and concept. That is his conventional nature. The deeper way he exists, his ultimate nature, is the emptiness of being an inherently existent Dalai Lama. Okay? So in the same way, you know, we appear to inherently exist. The people around us appear to inherently exist. When we look at each other, don't we feel like there's a real person somewhere inside each body? And that there's a real personality. You know, I know that person's personality. Yeah. And we even get the idea that they have a fixed personality. Yeah. And that's the way it is out there. That's who they are. Yeah. So we look at somebody who's committed a crime, you know, we say they're a criminal, that means we know everything about them, and we, you know, put them in the disposable box, okay? Somebody's a Republican, somebody's a Democrat, you know? These people are so stupid. Why don't they agree with my views? They're totally stupid. So on the basis of people's political ideas, we think we know everything about them as a human being. That they have a fixed Republican personality, a fixed Democrat personality that never changes. Totally predictable and despicable. Why? Because they don't agree with my ideas, and my ideas happen to be the right one. So these people also put them in the same box with the criminals, worthless. Yeah. Then we start going on and on. Yeah, And we start then looking on the people. Oh, well, these people are friends. But they aren't always friends. Sometimes they do things I don't like. They aren't so trustworthy after all. Okay. 
they get labeled untrustworthy, throw them in the box with the criminals and the Republicans or the Democrats. At the end of the day, who's left outside the box? Me! And then we wonder why we get lonely. <laughs> yeah, because we've pushed everybody away. They're all full of faults. And I am the one perfect one. Da, 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 da. Okay. So it's, um, do you see why it causes suffering? Yeah. Okay. So that person that's there that we think is so fixed isn't there. There's a person there that exists by being imputed and designated. But the fixed person that we think we know really well that is like that, when we try and find them, we can't. They're gone. Yeah, they're gone. Trump disappeared. <laughs> And you didn't even have to do anything except meditate on emptiness. Yeah? Because who you thought he was never existed to start with. And who he thinks he is, he do doesn't exist either. Yeah? So we're actually kind of living in, uh, uh, you know, in, in a nut house. <laughs> When you, you know, when you really have some idea of how, you know, even some little feeling of how things really exist, then you realize we're all walking around believing in things that don't really exist. But because they appear to us, we think they do. Whereas what exists, we, we don't see. We see it through that veil of all the false stuff that we've imputed on it. Yeah. For each phenomena, the two truths are present on that one base. For example, the mind has a veiled or conventional nature and a deeper reality or ultimate nature. Its conventional nature is its clarity and cognizance the mind that perceives and experiences things. Its ultimate nature is its emptiness of inherent existence. These two truths exist inseparably with respect to the mind. They're both there, although they are perceived by different cognizers. So one cognizer if we develop it, a yogic direct perceiver sees the emptiness of inherent existence of the mind. The other cognizer just looks at the mind without analysis and sees its conventional existence. Okay? But both, you know, things exist on that basis. There's a conventional truth there and there's an ultimate truth there. <clears throat> the conventional mind is perceived by a conventional reliable cognizer, while the ultimate nature of the mind is known by a wisdom mind that realizes emptiness. Although the two truths are different, they exist together and depend on each other. Okay? So two things that are very different can exist on one basis, yeah? And they depend on each other. For that reason, the mind and its emptiness are said to be one nature, but nominally different. The two truths are not two unrelated levels of being, with ultimate truth being some absolute independent reality separate from the world of independent things. So sometimes we get the idea when we hear ultimate truth, you know, 
I want to I want to realize the ultimate truth or dwell in the ultimate that the ultimate truth is like some, in some other universe, you know? This world is samsara and it stinks and ultimate truth is like way out there in space somewhere. Okay? But it's not like that. The ultimate truth, the emptiness is right here in all these objects and in us as well. It's an inseparable part of all people and persons and phenomena. We just don't see it. Okay. The very meaning of the term dependent arising enables us to gain insight into the union of the two truths. Everything exists dependent on or in relation to other factors that are not it. Flowers depend on seeds. A human being depends on his or her body and mind. Space depends on the lack of obstruction. Being dependent means that things are empty of inherent existence. Because remember, inherent existence means independent existence. And independent and dependent are contradictory. If you're one, you can't be the other. Mm -hmm. Being dependent, they are empty of inherent existence. But emptiness does not mean total non-existence. Because flowers, humans, and space arise or exist, these veiled truths exist. Hmm? Within the context of these appearances being dependent veiled truths, the Buddha taught the method aspect of the path to awakening. Because so many different uh, kinds of forms and appearances exist, they are called the vast, or the varieties of phenomena. Yeah. So, I mean, there's how many different phenomena in this universe? We can't count them all. They're called the varieties. They are all conventional truths. Yeah. They all have the same nature of emptiness. Okay. But in terms of their appearance, they're quite different. Within the context of phenomena's ultimate nature being emptiness, the Buddha taught the wisdom aspect of the path. The emptiness of phenomena is called the profound because it is free from conceptual fabrications and is realized by a profound wisdom consciousness. Method and wisdom together are called the stages of the vast and profound path. So all these vast things that exist in the world, okay, that exist only on the level of appearances, when we practice the method side of the path, here method refers to actions that we do motivated or, or informed by a mind of renunciation of samsara, informed by the mind of bodhicitta. Okay? So all the uh, accumulation of merit that we do by generosity and ethical conduct and fortitude and all these kinds of things, that's called the method aspect of the path because it's dealing with the variety of things, and through it we uh, create the collection of, of uh, merit. The ultimate nature of all these things is emptiness. That's called the profound path. That's perceived by a wisdom realizing emptiness. Okay, And that's called the wisdom aspect of the path because it's seeing things as they actually are. So it's called the profound path. We're looking deeper at how things exist. When we visualize the uh, merit field, if you look at that tanka there, you see on either side there's, there's two accumulations of, of figures, of lamas, up, up above the central figure. So the one on uh, Tsongkhapa's right which is on our left as we look at the altar, has Maitreya Buddha as the central figure, and then it's surrounded by all the 
lamas of the, uh, the vast lineage. On the other side, the uh, Tsongkhapa's left side, our right side as we face the altar, you have Manjushri, and then Manjushri is surrounded by all the lineages, uh, the lamas of the profound lineage. Okay, so th this thing, you know, comes up a lot in these, these two ways, okay? Mm -hmm. By meditating on the two truths and their inseparability, because you can't separate a convention, a veiled truth and an ultimate truth. Yeah. So the actual nature of things does not exist on some other planet as some absolute entity that's independent of everything else. Emptiness also is dependent. It's dependent on the conventional phenomena that it is the ultimate nature of. Okay. So that's why we say the two truths are inseparable. They're found together in each and everything. By meditating on the two truths and their inseparability and by cultivating the method and wisdom aspects of the path, all faulty states of mind are gradually removed and the excellent attributes of a Buddha's truth body and form body are developed. Buddhahood is attained through the unified cultivation of both method and wisdom. The chief wisdom is the wisdom realizing the emptiness of inherent existence. And in the Mahayana, the chief method is the altruistic intention to become a Buddha or bodhicitta, induced by great love and great compassion. Although practiced in tandem, method and wisdom each has its own principle result in Buddhahood. The principal result of method is the form bodies of the Buddha, the bodies in which a Buddha manifests in order to teach sentient beings, and the principal result of wisdom is the truth body of a Buddha, a Buddha's omniscient mind and its ultimate nature. So there's all these correlations, you know, we'll get into them later. Buddha Dharma can also be spoken of in terms of basis, path, and result. The basis is the two truths, conventional and ultimate. The path is the two cultivations, method and wisdom. The result is the two bodies of a Buddha, the form body and the truth body. When we say body here, it means like um, a collection, you know, like we say... Uh, um, huh? Yeah, the body of an artist's work or something, you know, the, the collection, the accumulation of it. Okay. Um, Buddha Dharma can, uh, yeah, we said that. Mm -hmm. Here we see the correlation of conventional truths, the method aspect of the path, and the form bodies of a Buddha. And the correlation of ultimate truths, the wisdom aspect of the path, and the truth body of a Buddha. The topics introduced in this chapter are complex and important. Only when we understand the nature and relationship of the two truths according to the Madhyamaka viewpoint can we fully understand the meaning of the four truths and know the full meaning and purpose of taking refuge in the three jewels. This chapter gave you a glimpse of these, and the fuller explanations that follow will elaborate on them. So the fuller explanations are the rest of this volume and the however many volumes <laughs> follow that. <laughs> the four seals, impermanence, dukkha, selflessness, and nirvana, are among the most important topics for us to know on the path. For that reason, in the following chapter, we will explore the reliable cognizers that enables us to have correct knowledge. Okay, so the topics we brought up in the first chapter, the four seals and the two truths, are the most, you know, among the really the most important things that we have to understand on the path. But to understand things, we have to also know which are reliable minds 
you know, because we have all sorts of cognitions, yeah? And some of them are hallucinations, and some of them are downright wrong, and, you know, so we need to learn how to discern among all the uh, cognizers that we have which ones are reliable and which ones aren't. Okay? Yeah, because you can see, you know, if, if somebody takes drugs and they start seeing pink elephants floating along on purple daisies, um, you know, we're going to say, hey, uh, you know, that mind, you're seeing that, but that doesn't mean those things really exist. Yeah, because if you're going to try and pick those purple daisies and preserve the elephants riding on them and put them in a vase, you know, you're going to have some trouble. So, you know, because your, your cognition is, is incorrect. Okay? So, it's like that. So, here's chapter two, the gaining non-deceptive knowledge. As human beings, we want to accomplish certain goals and purposes. In the area of spirituality and religion, our aim is to attain a state of enduring fulfillment and peace. To determine if full awakening is possible, to know what to practice and abandon in order to attain awakening, and to discern the ultimate nature of all phenomena, we need to be able to test various claims and determine if they are accurate and non-deceptive. Right? In a meditation session, we want to be aware of what type of cognizer, what kind of mind or consciousness or mental state is knowing impermanence and emptiness. Because a correct assumption of emptiness is very different from a non conceptual realization of emptiness. Okay? So thinking, Oh, yeah, yeah, things are empty. They lack an inherent nature. Yeah, so that's, that's good. You got the words. But that's not a direct perception of emptiness. Okay, so we have to understand what these different kinds of minds are. <laughs> yeah, because otherwise, you know, this is where you get people making all sorts of false claims about their spiritual realizations because they can't tell what are reliable cognizers and what aren't. Mm -hmm. The disciplines of logic and epistemology contain the tools for doing so. The objects that we seek to ascertain with reliable cognizers include the two truths and those spoken of in the four seals, impermanence, dukkha, selflessness, and nirvana. When speaking of cognizers and perceivers, we are referring to minds that know objects. They are agents that perform the function of knowing their objects. And the reason I say this is because often in other books, they will talk about reliable cognition, when you put it, or reliable perception, when you put it as cognition, that's different than cognizer, isn't it? The word cognizer really gives you the idea that there's a consciousness that is cognizing. There's an agent doing the action of cog cognizing. Whereas cognition, that's a much vaguer word, at least to me, you know? It's a cognition. Yeah? Whereas cognizers, you're referring to a, a, a specific mental state. Okay? Also, I change also many people use the term valid cognizers. And uh, actually, when you research the meaning of uh, of the Sanskrit word, what it means is reliable because it's like the first sentence here. As human beings, we want to accomplish certain goals and purposes. Yeah. So cognizers, 
that en enable us to accomplish those goals and purposes are reliable ones. To me, saying valid gives a whole different meaning. And I'm just telling you this, because you may read some other book that where it's translated as valid cognizer. To me, valid smacks of, you know, something out there from its own side is valid. But reliable, a reliable cognizer means it's a cognizer that we can rely upon to accomplish our purposes. Okay? That's why I change the, the, how other people use it. Some people do use reliable cognizer. Okay. This chapter contains terminology and ideas that will be new to some readers. It takes time and further study to understand everything completely. You will understand some points now and can return to this chapter later as a resource in your future studies. Actually, this whole book is, and the whole series is meant to be something that you read many, many, many times and that you refer to as you, as you continue to practice. Yeah. Okay, so we start out with three kinds of objects and their cognizers. As we learn the Buddha Dharma, we are exposed to new concepts that may challenge our view of the world and of reality. Just a little bit, like what our senses see is, you know, things don't exist the way they appear. Just a little bit, they challenge. We may wonder how to go about verifying or disproving yeah, these different views. Shantarakshita's Compendium on Reality quotes the Buddha as recommending an analytical approach. So he said, Do not accept my dharma merely out of respect for me, but analyze and check it, the way a goldsmith analyzes gold, by burning, cutting, and rubbing it. This is a very famous quotation. It took me so long to find out where it, its source was. You find it in so many books, but they don't usually mention the source. So it's Shantarakshita. But, well, he quotes the Buddha as saying this, okay? So first, a goldsmith checks for external impurities, which can be detected by burning the gold. Then he looks for internal impurities by cutting the gold. Finally, he searches for very subtle impurities using a special technique of filing or rubbing the gold. Similarly, we must test the teachings thoroughly, looking for three types of, quote, quote, impurities. Okay, so one type is incorrect explanations regarding evident phenomena, then in incorrect explanations regarding slightly obscure phenomena, and incorrect explanations regarding very obscure phenomena. If there are none, we can accept the teachings with confidence. Each of these three types of phenomena is known by a specific kind of reliable cognizer. Okay? So there's three types of, of cognize three types of phenomena. Each one is known by a specific kind of cognizer. And so, you know, in that way, you can test, are you having the right cognizer for what you're cognizing? Yeah? Or are you just kind of guessing and making things up? Mm -hmm. Okay. So evident phenomena, the first one are those that ordinary beings can easily perceive. These include, one, external objects such as colors, sounds, odors, tastes, and tangible objects, which are known by direct, reliable cognizers that correspond to our five physical senses. So there's direct minds. They see those objects with uh, directly and... Uh, and they are not mistaken, they're reliable, okay? 
So and it, that direct that you know goes to you know the colors, sounds, smells, taste, tactile objects, things like that of our five senses. Then the second type of evident phenomena are internal objects, such as feelings of happiness, pain, hopes, and <laughs> desires, which are known by the mental consciousness. Okay, so talking about the rough mental consciousness. So things that go on inside of us, feelings, you know, pains, hopes, desires, all these kinds of things. So that's evident phenomena. Okay. Then slightly obscure phenomena, these ones cannot initially be directly perceived. So the first time we know them, we can't perceive them directly. Yeah. We have to perceive them through inference. But later, as we can become more and more familiar with inference, we're able to break through inference and actually see these things directly. Okay, So slightly obscure phenomena cannot initially be directly perceived. Ordinary beings must initially know them by factual inferential cognizers. Okay? So the first evident phenomena, they're known by direct reliable cognizers. Slightly obscure phenomena, they're known by factual inter inferential cognizers. So inferential reco reliable cognizers based on valid factual reasons. So examples of slightly obscure phenomena are subtle impermanence, the momentary arising and ceasing of conditioned things, because we can't see, you know, the momentary change like this of things with our eyes. Yeah? The first way we can initially know it is by using reasoning. Okay? Also, um, selflessness is something, or emptiness is something that initially we can't know with our, our senses or our gross mental consciousness. We can only know it by using reasoning. Okay? So here, you can see the difference between the field of investigation of science and the field of investigation of Buddhism. Because both science and Buddhism want to investigate and understand the world. Science is interested in the evident phenomena. Specifically, among the evident phenomena, you know, scientific instruments can know things that are atomic in nature. Okay? So we have great things for knowing stuff that's very small, for knowing stuff that's very far away. Yeah? But the, uh, the scientific instruments are can only we can only know things through them if those things are made if they if they're material yeah so other things like these ob slightly obscure phenomena the subtle impermanence emptiness scientific instruments cannot know these in fact even some of the evident phenomena that in our internal ones, like our feelings of pleasure and pain, scientific instruments can know what's happening in the brain and the body that correlate with certain feelings. But scientific instruments cannot help us know those feelings directly because each of us our, our feelings of pleasure and pain are internal to us. Okay? You can talk about them with words. You can talk about what's happening in the brain when different emotions are happening. But none of that is the actual experience. Okay? So when we look at... You know, science is totally wonderful at what it can research and know, but it's also, its field of investigation is also limited. 
Okay. Because the mind, for example, that which is clarity and cognizance. Yeah? Are you going to see that through a microscope, through a telescope, with your direct eyes? Yeah? It doesn't have any shape or color or odor or atomic nature or anything. You can't see it through those instruments. Okay. Okay. Um, examples of slightly obscure phenomena are subtle impermanence and selflessness and emptiness. The fact that the apple arises in dependence on causes and conditions is part of the conventional nature of the apple. Through understanding that it ex its existence is a result of causes and conditions, we can know that the apple is impermanent. But that's all done through using reasoning. And reasoning is a conceptual consciousness. Okay? Our eye consciousness doesn't reason. It just sees color and shape. Okay? So it's another kind of mental consciousness that does this reasoning. The sun setting in the West is coarse change that is evident to our visual sense. You know, we can see the sunset. But to understand the sun's subtle changeable nature, we must use reasoning to understand it initially. After that, we can develop a yogic direct perceiver and then we can see it with a special kind of mental consciousness. Okay. But to understand the change subtle, the sun's subtle changeable nature, we must use reasoning. The sun rose in the east, and in order to set in the west, it must move continuously, moment by moment, imperceptibly across the sky. This momentary change cannot be detected by our eyes initially. We need reasoning to know it. Actually, I don't think it can ever, well, maybe Buddha can detect it with his eyes, but we can't. To know a slightly obscure phenomenon, such as selflessness, for example, the absence of a permanent independent soul or self, we may use the reason of dependence and contemplate the syllogism. So here's the syllogism. Consider a person. She does not exist as a permanent, partless, under its own power, soul, or self, because she depends on her body and mind. Okay, so those of you who have been following Thursday night, yeah, you can see what's the subject? Person. What's the predicate? And what's the reason? Okay. And so what's the thesis? Uh, okay, good. And what's the, um, uh, how do you show that the reason applies to the subject? What's that? Yeah, how do we do, what is that in the syllogism? Yeah, a person depends on her body and mind. What's the pervasion? Good. Okay. So people who weren't here for Thursday didn't get that, but the other ones, they're getting somewhere. <laughs> and so they can explain this about syllogisms to you during the break time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then very obscure phenomena, this is the third kind of phenomena, are known by ordinary sentient beings 
by relying on inferential reliable cognizers by authoritative testimony. So there's different kinds of inferential reliable cognizers. The slightly obscure ones are known initially by factual inferential cognizers. The very obscure ones are known by inferential reliable cognizers by authoritative testimony, which means the att attestation of someone who is authoritative in that field. <laughs> so lots of times when we don't know something, we can't see it directly, we can't have uh, factual, you know, inferential reasoning, then we ask somebody who's an authority about that to explain it to us, and that's how we know. Yeah? So we rely on the authoritative ex testimony of an expert. Yeah. So we'll get into the whole topic of what makes somebody an authoritative uh, expert, you know, that's, that's another thing that we'll get into. Okay, so an example here is we know our birthday by asking our mother. Yeah, we understand for sure our mother is going to remember our birthday. Yeah, it might have been one of the days in which she experienced more pain than any other time in her life. Okay, they call it labor for a reason. Okay, <laughs> they don't forget <laughs> when their kids are born. <laughs> Okay, so we can know our birthday by asking our mother. She's the authority. And we understand the subtle intricacies of karma by depending on the Buddha's teachings. While atoms and subatomic particles are slightly obscure phenomena that can be known by inference, most of us rely on the testimony of scientists to know their existence and characteristics, don't we? Yeah, we don't go out and, uh, you know, do the experiments ourselves and validate everything. We read the magazine, and it says science discovers blah, blah, and we say, well, those guys are experts, so I believe what they say. Of course, you know, scientists will tell you, yes, they're experts, but you shouldn't believe everything they say, <laughs> yeah? Because uh, scientific studies often are only, they're only hitting them on the probability of something happening. Yeah. So, for, for example, uh, I mean, I just re remember some years ago, butter was bad to eat. Yeah. Too much saturated fat. We should not eat butter very much. Yeah. We should have margarine. Yeah, that was discovered by science. You know, all these saturated fats are not good for you. Then, a few years later, oh, saturated fats are, uh, no, the margarine that we told you to eat, that's full of what kind of fats? Hydrogenated fats. Hydrogenated fats. Trans. Trans fats. You know, some other kind of fat, you know? So we told you to eat that before. We thought it was better than the fats and butter, but we were wrong. Don't have margarine. You should eat butter because you need the, you know, if you have saturated fats in a moderate amount, it's good. But these trans fats are really bad for you, you know? And so, you know, what science tells us, it, it changes a lot, Yeah. And the scientists will be the first ones to tell you that, you know, especially like in medical research and stuff like that, they're really just saying, you know, most people, da 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 such and such percentage of people, DDD, but such and such a percent of people, da 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 you know, but we just kind of think, oh, well, they said 60%, so that's everybody. <laughs> yeah, so I should do that too, but that's n not it. Okay, so um, then, according to Satantrikas, for those of you who may have had some doubt when I read what, what evident phenomena are, because you remember what it said in the book. 
According to Satantrikas, from the viewpoint of direct perceivers, all functioning things are evident phenomena because under the right conditions, they can be perceived by our direct perceivers. Remember that? They said all of them are evident phenomena. Yeah, but here they aren't all evident phenomena. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, from the viewpoint of conceptual consciousnesses, all knowable objects, both impermanent and permanent, are obscure phenomena because they cannot be they can be known by a conceptual consciousness thinking about them. Conceptual consciousnesses, okay, so a conceptual consciousness is when you're thinking. And so what, what's actually appearing to your mind is a conceptual appearance, or some people say mental image, of the object. Yeah, it's not the object. Yeah. When you, if you put, if you, uh, if we're talking about your mother right now, you have an idea of your mother. Yeah. Is that really your, what's appearing to your mind? Is that really your mother? No. Okay. It's a conceptual appearance to your mother. So of your mother. So that's called a conceptual mind, a thought consciousness that is thinking of your mother. Okay. Okay, so from the viewpoint of conceptual consciousness, all knowable objects, both impermanent and permanent, are obscure phenomena because they can be known by a conceptual consciousness thinking about them. Conceptual consciousnesses are obscured because they know things by means of a conceptual appearance, which obstructs them from seeing functioning things directly. So when you're thinking about something, it's very different from actually experiencing it. Okay, so we're gonna have medicine meal soon. Do you think about the soup that's gonna be there? Okay, so you can think about soup. You can have a very clear visualization of it, but you can't eat your visualization. <laughs> okay, so there's a difference there. Prasangikas describe evident and obscure phenomena differently, saying that evident objects are those that can be known through our own experience without depending on inference, for example, sense objects. Obscure objects must initially be known by depending on a reason. They are objects of inference, for example, the subtle impermanence of the body and the selflessness of the person. Okay, so in, inference is a conceptual mind, different than direct perceivers. Okay, because for the Satantrika, all phenomena are put as evident phenomena. For, uh, yeah, yeah, all functioning things. For the Prasangika, Evident phenomena are only ones that are evident to us right now. Okay, other things, um, you know, we have to infer. I remember when I was asking His Holiness about it, he, he put a, a, box, a thing of tissues under it in his donka, and he said, you know, you can't see the tissues, they aren't an evident phenomena. But if I tell you they're there, you know, based on if you trust me as an authoritative uh, testimony, then you'll know that they're there. Okay, so that kind of difference there. It'll, it'll continue, you know. So would Sautrantika say that the subtle impermanence of a sun moving across the sky because it's a functioning thing is an evident phenomenon? Yeah, because with the right conditions, you can know it. Okay. No, it's slightly, I, though, even though it's, it's slightly obscured as far as prosengikas go. Right. Okay. Right. Unless, I'm not sure if they would um, limit direct perceivers 
to ordinary beings, direct perceivers. They probably they might do that and say that subtle impermanence can only be known by a yogic direct perceiver. Okay. But, you know, uh, something else, the soup in the kitchen, yeah, we can, it, we can know directly because given the right condi- conditions, are walking in there. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so these categories are described in relation to ordinary sentient beings, not Aryas. Okay, for an Arya, here's the answer. So let me finish reading this section before we have questions. It might answer some of your questions. For an Arya, subtle impermanence and selflessness are evident phenomena for an Arya, whereas for us, they are slightly obscure. There are no obscure objects for Buddhists because they are omniscient. Even in terms of ordinary sentient beings, These categories can vary according to our situation. When we are at a campfire, the fire is evident to us. We see it with our eyes and feel the heat on our skin. To people on the other side of a clump of trees, the campfire is slightly obscure. They must infer it. So they think in the area behind those trees, there is fire because there is smoke. To our friends in another state, the campfire is very obscure. Yeah, they can't see it. They can't infer it because they can't see the smoke. They know it because we call and tell them that we are at a campfire and they trust us. (laughs) Another example is devas, celestial beings such as the god Brahma. For us human beings who live on earth, Brahma is very obscure. We know about him only through the testimony of a reliable authority. Yeah, Our senses cannot see him, and no amount of reasoning can prove his existence. Yeah, So this is why, you know, we come into Buddhism and we hear, oh, there's realms of, you know, celestial beings. And we go, yeah, prove it to me. And of, these aren't things that can be seen by the eye. They aren't things that can be observed uh, or that can be inferred. So our way of knowing them is by trusting the, the scriptures. And then depending on how much you trust the scriptures, you may believe in these things or not. And then we're going to get to it uh, later in the chapter. There's also criteria for uh, what makes something a reliable scripture. Okay, so it's not just, well, it's in the canon, so believe it. You know, there's ways to test it. Yeah, I mean, we don't, we shouldn't trust everybody who's an authority because authorities can make mistakes. Yeah. Okay, to other living beings born in that realm, Brahma is evident. Similarly, To people watching a spacecraft land on the moon, that event is evident. But to people who have no idea that such a thing is possible, it is very obscure. They must trust the testimony of those who witnessed it to know it happened. You know, so when they went and talked to people in some remote parts of the planet and told them that people walked on the moon, the people said it's impossible. They didn't believe it. Yeah, because they didn't trust the, you know, what the the authorities said. An object becomes evident, slightly obscure or very obscure, in relation to an individual. For ordinary beings who haven't entered a path, subtle impermanence and emptiness are slightly obscure. While for Aryas, they are evident phenomena known by yogic direct perceivers. To our mother, our birthday is an evident phenomena, but for us, it is a very obscure phenomena, even though we were present and experienced it. Isn't that strange? Owing to the extremely long distance, the details of various stars and planets in the universe are very obscure to us, but they are evident to whatever life forms inhabit those places. 
Various aspects of one thing may be different types of objects. Our friend's body is an evident phenomenon that we can see with our eyes. His heart is a slightly obscure phenomenon that we infer because all human bodies have hearts. The karmic causes for our friend to be born into that body are very obscure phenomena known only by a Buddha. Okay? So that's a very good illustration how different aspects of one thing uh, depend on different kinds of cognizers. Okay, so then uh, there's reflection. Let me see. Uh, Okay, so reflections. Make examples of evident phenomena slightly obscure phenomena and very obscure phenomena you already, that you already know. How did you come to understand them and which type of reliable cognizer was involved? Okay, so right now, talk to the person next to you and discuss this for a minute or two. Okay, and each take turns making examples of evident, slightly obscure phenomena and very obscure phenomena, and then the kind of reliable cognizer. So the sound you're hearing with a direct perceiver, but the sound infers that it's time for us to come together as a group. <laughs> okay. So, is that helpful to make you think a little bit? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so while you're having medicine meal, <laughs> do the other two questions, okay? Consider how we know things such as the existence of atoms, the ice age, or the qualities of other solar systems. Which of the three types of objects are they and how do we know them? Okay, and then the third question, this, this one's very interesting. If you have never been to Antarctica, which of the three categories of phenomena is Antarctica in relationship to you? Is it very obscure because you have to depend on another person's testimony to know what it looks like? Is it slightly obscure because by seeing a photograph or a 3D model, you can infer what it looks like? Would it be evident because you could see it through live streaming on the internet? Okay, so talk about this at medicine meal and, and at breakfast. Yeah. Because this type of discussion is what will really bring it home and make it alive for you. Okay. So be prepared because I'll ask you about it tomorrow. Okay.